In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Janine Shepard. What did Janine do after doctors told her she would never walk again? If you remember one thing from this interview, listen when she talks about the hills. That and much more coming up right now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Janine Shepard. Now, just to tell you a little bit about Janine, her story reads like a plot of a Hollywood movie. She was a champion cross-country skier in training for the Winter Olympics, and her life was altered, where doctors told her she would never walk again. Janine is a best-selling author of Never Tell Me Never, which was also turned into a movie. She's also an internationally renowned speaker who travels extensively in Australia, all over the world, sharing her story with others. She's going to be in L.A., Phoenix, Miami, Kansas City, San Diego, all these places coming up soon. So I watched her TED Talk, and it was just absolutely captivating. Um, One fun fact about Janine is she likes to fly upside down. Right, Janine? <laughs> I absolutely do. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best. It's the only way to go. <laughs> so, you know, Janine, many people talk about how we have so many things stopping us from what we really want out of life. You know, everything from being too young, too old, we're not experienced, mm-hmm. you know, our health issues and many more. And you're the perfect person to talk about how we can overcome some of these challenges we have in our life and how you overcame that life-altering event in yours. Mm-hmm. Could you tell people a little bit about some of the um that painful moment, those emotional low points and what happened with the accident? Well, I think, Jeremy, you know, one of the the greatest, I guess, emotional, you know, realizations for me was when I got home from the Spine Award and, you know, I thought that I'd be able to go back and have my career as an elite athlete still, but the realization that, you know, that these injuries were permanent. So, you know, that was a really, that was a moment for me when I really wished I hadn't come back to to my body and, you know, I wanted to give up. And, you know, I mean, as I say to people, you know, rock bottom is the perfect place to start because, you know, that's the point where you really have to take the inner journey. You know, it's so easy when things are going, you know, when things are going well, it's so easy to stay on the surface. But that's not what it's about. I mean, that's not how we grow. That's not how we learn. And and really, um, the great joy in life is to, to go underneath the surface, to dig deep and to find out who we really are. So, you know, we need to embrace all of those times, what I call the hills in life, because they're the greatest teachers. Yeah. So can you, for people who don't know, can you tell them what exactly happened with the accident? Well, I was on a training bike ride with my fellow teammates. I was uh, preparing for the Winter Olympics, and when I was on my push bike, I was a push bike, I was run over by a truck. <laughs> now, I actually died, you know, several times. I mean, I... Um, when they put me in the helicopter to take me to hospital, my blood pressure was 40 over nothing. So I had multiple injuries. I broke my neck and my back in six places. I broke five ribs on my left side. I broke my collarbone, my right arm, bones in my feet, massive blood loss, head injuries. I yeah. lost five liters of blood. So, you know, I'm not meant to be here. They took me to the spinal ward. Um, and for really 10 days, I was critical in intensive care. And I had an experience of leaving my body and really shifting between two dimensions and having to make the choice of you know whether I would come back to this body because it was so badly broken so really knowing um, that was a really seminal moment for me because making the choice to come back I mean for me it's very clear that I made that choice but in fact all of us have actually made that choice even if we can't remember it so therefore you know this body that we're in needs to be honored because you know where as i say to people wherever you are right now is where you're meant to be so this is the perfect moment so you know for me um being an elite athlete and then probably everybody's worst nightmare you know waking up paralyzed in a spinal ward um it was it was you know it was my worst nightmare and and being an athlete and in my final year at university and my whole life revolved around sports so really it was everything that for me defined who I was as a person so what was going on in that moment when you were deciding do you remember that? oh yeah I I mean it's very difficult to explain to people 
you know, what that experience is like because it wasn't the normal, you know, experience of, you know, down a tunnel and leaving your body. For me, it was a shifting in and out of dimensions. So, you know, my understanding or my experience of that is that, you know, that there really isn't any death. We're, you know, it's really the one dimension and we're just shifting in and out. You know, there's in the body and out of the body, but really who we are is unchanged. So that's given me a really unique insight into my life and, and who I am. You know, it did, certainly didn't mean that coming back to my body was going to be easy. Um, you know, coming back to my body meant that I made the choice to, to, to keep that experience, that, that incredible opportunity to learn and to grow. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I embraced that experience, but it certainly hasn't, hasn't been easy, nor, nor should it be. So, um, you know, it was, um, it was a, it was a gift, but it's taken a long time to have the insight to look back and, and see that. Yeah. So when you woke up after this happened, do you remember what you were thinking at the time? I mean, did you even know what, what was going on? It was very, it was very confusing. Um, I didn't want to come back. I mean, I knew that letting go would be, in a sense, an easy option, but I was given that choice. I had people with me and I was given the choice. So, you know, I decided to come back. But amazingly, you know, I decided to come back to this body that was so broken. And, you know, it's taken a long time to not just find the forgiveness of, you know, the person that ran me over and, and um, you know, which was an important part of the journey, but also to forgive myself and find, you know, the, the sort of gratitude for my life and also you know, the sort of, um, what I say, the self-love that we all actually need because when when you're a, a paraplegic or when you're a person with a disability, it takes a lot to find that sort of self-love and care for yourself because mm -hmm. there are things about your body that that you don't like. So that's been an incredible journey for me, embracing all of those parts and also understanding that, that the body is not who I am. And... You know, and in fact, you know, there's parts of that, well, all of that really, that I've learned to love because it's been, it's kept my heart open and it's allowed me to find an incredible sense of compassion towards other people going through similar circumstances. Yeah. Now, talking about some of those low points, those emotions going on, can you tell us some of the, the proudest moments after that you've been able to accomplish personally and professionally? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say that one of the, I mean, there are so, there are so many because, you know, when I left hospital, they didn't think that, you know, they, I mean, I remember the doctor saying to me, you'll have to rethink your life because you'll never be able to do the things you did before. And I, I remember thinking, you know, she can't be right. I mean, I'm going to go back and get my life back. And of course that didn't happen. They also said that I would never have children again because of the extent of my internal injuries. So for me, having my first child was, um, an incredible moment for me because I actually don't have any feeling from the waist down. So, you know, right. they they didn't know whether I would be able to give birth normally or whether it was even possible. So, you know, I've had three children since then and, and wow. all completely normal, healthy births. So, you know, they have been incredible moments for me because being a parent wasn't something that, you know, that I ever thought that I you know, aspired to greatly because my life as an athlete took precedence. But, it, you know, the funny thing is when someone says you can't do something, you really you really want to do it. So when they said to me, you know, you'll never have children, you know, it was like, right, okay. So it's been um, that, that those moments of, of becoming a parent have definitely been highlights for me. Yeah, I mean, that's probably a mindset too, even that you took an Olympic training where – you know, someone's not going to tell you what you can't do. You know, you're just going to pers persist through it. And that's, you know, it, it's amazing. That's probably what, why you were able to overcome all this. What about professionally? What professionally have you been able to uh, accomplish because of your, your mindset and you were able to overcome Well, this? I think that, you know, I've now written five books and my first book, Never Tell Me Never, you know, was, was made into a movie. So that's a great you know, professional achievement and, you know, and being on the speaking circuit and speaking around the world and speaking, you know, on the stage in the Netherlands with Cherie Blair and, of course, doing my TED Talk. So, you know, professionally, I, you know, I love being able to get up on the stage and also, you know, 
complete, you know, finishing five books, um, you know, of course, being an author also wasn't something that, you know, I ever aspired to because my athletic career took precedence. So, you know, there's so many things, you know, becoming an author, a best-selling author, you know, being an international speaker, and of course, also professionally, becoming a pilot, you know, being being a paraplegic or partial paraplegic, and not just, you know, I mean, not just any pilot, I then went on and became a, a commercial pilot and an aerobatics flying instructor, so, you know, they've been great milestones for me, and again, you know, all of these things, when people said I wouldn't be able to do these things, it just drives me further to, to dig that little deeper and, and really explore the possibilities in life because, as I say to people, don't let other people set your limitations. Go out and find out for yourself what is possible because, you know, so often we we listen to what other people tell us is or isn't possible and we we don't even try. And I think the fun is in just exploring, you know, what is possible. That's the fun. I mean, life has to be fun and and a daring adventure, as Helen Keller said. Right. So how did you overcome some of those, um, you know, challenges when you're going to become a pilot and all those things? What were some of the things you did? Well, firstly, I have to say, you know, the really important aspect of all of this for me was finding acceptance, acceptance of the situation um, being able to say, well, you know, not not to focus on my injuries, but to really say, okay, I'm going to just be totally in this moment. I'm going to, I mean, I've had to use a catheter. I've had to, you know, be in a wheelchair and, and you know, and I learned to walk again. But really accepting all of those things as just what I have to do and not focusing on them. So that gave me the opportunity then to, to explore other things in life. I mean, you know, it wasn't till I really let go, as I tell people, it wasn't till I let go of hanging on to the resentment and the anger about those things that I was really able to then look to the future and, and suddenly, you know, doors opened for me in, in ways that I could never have imagined. And, you know, sitting in a wheelchair and, and thinking, wow, you know, if I can't walk, then maybe I'll just learn to fly. I mean, crazy things and I find that that is a pattern that doesn't just work in my life but you know everybody's life once we let go of resentments once we let go of hanging hanging on to the past we're really able then to sort of look to the not just the future but the present and find opportunities in wherever we are there are there are always infinite possibilities yeah so once you accept that Again, that's that's a really tough thing in itself. What's the next thing you did to have to to accomplish what you did have done so far, even? Well, that's a good question. I mean, to me, acceptance is is the first part. The next part is surrender. For me, is is accepting and then also letting go. And I think for me, what comes with that is, you know, I mean, I feel like at times I'm bombarded with with ideas that just, you know, come to me. And I think just really, you know, so it's the surrender and letting go process to me. And, you know, for me, what works is to sit in silence, you know, to sit in meditation, to to be really present in the moment. And then, and then for me, I start brainstorming and, you know, I start writing down ideas and, and, and that's the next step. I mean, to, to, to then sort of goal set, but the, the important thing about that is that in the West, we are so focused on goals. And I tell people, don't focus on go- goals, focus on values first. Mm-hmm. What do you really want your life to stand for? Who do you want to be in this life? Because I, no one can guarantee you that you can achieve those, you know, the goals that you think you want to achieve. I, I didn't get to the Olympics because of my accident, but I could still live according to my values. And so once we do that and we set our goals from our values, not the other way around, then it doesn't matter what happens in life. It doesn't matter what challenges we face or what hiccups or whatever. We can still live a life that is in accord with our values. We can still live a rich, full and meaningful life and nothing will then take us off track. It's that simple. 
Do you remember one I, one of those ideas that popped in your head in what you did? Just so we can get a specific example that will stick out. Back then or recently? Um, either one. Well, were you, were you um, able to kind of work take... through? Well, when I was, you know, when I was in my wheelchair and I decided to learn to fly, and everyone thought it was absolutely crazy. Um, you know, I mean, I'm very, I'm very much focused on. Um, just do it. There's my, you know, the Nike phrase, just do it. And, you know, when something comes, I think that if you, you know, if you have ideas, the way that I work actually is I go out there and just explore them all because, you know, they're not all going to work, but one of them is, you know, and along the way you'll find out which one's going to work. And so I've always got projects going left, right and centre and sometimes then, you know, sometimes some of them don't work and I go, okay, well, that wasn't meant to be and I'll keep going. But, you know, when I decided to learn to fly, um, you know, I pick up the phone book. I look through the phone book. I look up flying schools. I pick up the phone. You know, I make an appointment. You know, I get driven out there in my plaster cut body cast and my wheelchair and get carried into an aeroplane. I mean, wow. people thought it was crazy. Okay, what do I do next? You know, I get the books. I start studying. I mean, I think it's a matter of just staying totally focused on where you are now, you know, and not looking back. You know, and not looking forward. I mean, you need goals, sure. But what we need to do is just really embrace the step that we're taking right now. And, you know, we just need to be flexible because things change along the way. When I first started learning to fly, I never, ever intended to be a commercial pilot or an aerobatics flying instructor because everyone, I mean, it just wasn't in my awareness but when you really enjoy where you are right now, possibilities will arise, you know, will arise, and then you can follow on from them. And it's, to me, that's what it's about. It's about awareness. It's about keeping an open mind. It's about enjoying, you know, where you are now, enjoying the journey. And, you know, and I, I, I mean, I just love exploring that. I mean, life is um, an experience to be enjoyed, and. It doesn't mean that we're going to be happy 24-7 because that's impossible. Right. But when we live like that, we can find this sense of, you know, purpose that I talked about even in the difficult moments. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people are going through their own challenges. Everyone's different. What's one thing you'd want to leave the audience with to do right now to start overcoming their personal and professional challenges? Well, that's a big question yeah. because I, you know, I would never, I would never tell anybody how to do anything. But I can, I can share with them, you know, my personal philosophy, which is, sure. when I, when I was a young athlete, I tell people that I learned to love the hills. I always trained on the hills because, you know, I knew that, you know, that they would make me strong, physically, and they also made me mentally strong. And it was that mentality of loving the hills that. I've used throughout my life. You know, even when I was sitting in a wheelchair, paralyzed at home after hospital, wanting to give up, you know, I really said to myself, okay, this is just another hill. Sure, it's the biggest hill I've already had, I've ever had, but it's another hill. And once I accepted that, once I accepted that the hills keep coming, you know, it's not like you get over one and there's never another, another one. They're always there. Once I accepted that, then I learned to love them. And loving the hills is understanding in a deeper way what they're there for. That every hill is there to teach us something about our lives and about ourselves. And that is the gift. And to me, that's, you know, that's the most important thing to understand that the experience that you're having right now, whatever it be, as tough as it can be, is perfect for wherever you are in your life right now. It's designed for you. Don't push it away. Don't, you know, don't reject it. Actually embrace it for what it is. And when you can do that, you will transform it. Yeah. No, I like that. Yeah, you should think of it as that, that hill. That, that metaphor yeah. of the hill. Yeah, I really like Absolutely. that. 
Yeah, learn to love the hills, I say, and anything is possible. <laughs> Maybe the title of your next book. Um, <laughs> yeah. What's a, a tool or a system you use in your daily life? You're talking a little bit about the meditation. What's um, like a, something you do in your routine that helps you? Okay, I'm just moving around. Sorry about that. I love the tour. Okay. Um, I love the tour. Yeah, this is my love. Okay. Um, well, I would say there are many, you know, many tools that I use. Um, obviously, for me, being able to to not just formally meditate, which I I do, but you know, practicing mindfulness, which is being able to um, just bring it back to the moment right now. So, you know, a few little techniques I use are, you know, a great technique is stop. You know, if, just throughout the day, just practice stop, which is, you know, stop the automatic thinking that's going on right now because a lot of the time we get so caught up in worrying about things that are never going to happen. So stop is about stopping that automatic thinking, taking a breath right now and being where you are, then taking a moment to observe what am I seeing? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What's going on right now? And then proceeding with whatever you were doing. But it's a very simple technique that you know people can take. Just remember, stop a couple of times throughout the day. Yeah. Um, whether whether it's you know sitting at home working on your computer, or going for a walk. So those sort of mindfulness practices for me. Um, you know, not only great for getting some clarity about where you want to go, but also for relieving stress. And, you know, I do that often. I'll just get up and I'll go for a walk. Not just a walk, but a mindful walk where I just can really focus on what's going on around me. I mean, and you, I think, you hear that about a lot of successful people. They do that. They meditate or they just stop and, you know, shut off that automatic thinking or that automatic action that they do. Do you remember a time like recently that you just rem you just kind of caught yourself and you stopped? I do it all the time, every day. I mean, I practice it all the time, and and you know, it's also um, the greatest tool for creativity because you know I've just rewritten I've just written a new introduction for my first book, uh, and a week ago I sat and I you know nothing was coming, and when I completely let go of wanting to do it. I sat down and it just came and I wrote for a week non-stop and I think that's the key is just get out of the way yeah. get out of the yeah. way you know and um, you know it's about recognizing that you know what we think is best for us isn't always the best thing for us so you know getting out of your way and, and um, letting things unfold as they should yeah I knew you'd have a good one for this because you're a trained Olympic athlete, and so you have those that you know those systems or those things that you live by, and you're disciplined. So I knew you'd have some good ones. <laughs> I, that's one <laughs> one thing I am is very disciplined, and not to the point of you know um, you know being mechanical, but the discipline of almost you know the paradox of that, the discipline of of being not disciplined and and being able to let go because um, as an athlete you become very um, you know, perfectionists in what in what you do. So you know, I've become almost you know the opposite of that. In that, um, I love the moments of absolutely doing nothing. They're my favourite moments. You know, just sitting down and 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 doing nothing. And um, I find again that that's you know the moments of, of greatest creativity. And uh, you know, I'll give you an example actually. Uh, a few, uh, just over a year ago, I, my latest little book is called The Gift of Acceptance. Now, I didn't plan that book. People are always saying to me, what's your next, next book? And I say, well, I don't plan them. They just, you know, I just wait for them. So I went for a bike ride. And while I was on my bike, of all places, you know, where I had my accident is often the, the place of greatest inspiration. So I was on a bike ride. And while I was riding, this idea came in my head. And I just raced home on my bike and started writing and of course um, that produced this little book called The Gift of Acceptance which is um, about to be published by Hallmark in America uh, this August wow. and um, it's actually my favorite book it's it's a book of um, aphorisms and and what I've learned from my journey so um, again it's 
it wasn't planned. You know, it was just um, letting go. And for me, exercise is a great uh, tool for meditation because you're totally in your body. So I find that some of my greatest ideas come when I'm riding my bike. Yeah. No, I love that. So we should stop and just the inspiration will come. And so just to tell and people... Find, and find what works for you because, you know, for some people, you know, uh, formal meditation might not be the thing that works for them. For some mm. people, it might be going for a run or it might be going for a bike ride. You know, it, it might be walking in nature. Um, whatever works for you, I don't think you have to necessarily, you know, make it formalized, although I think that it does help if you have a routine. But mm-hmm. um, I think it's about being in the body and not in the mind. So I think, you know, from often with exercise because you're in you're really in your body and you're able to feel it's very easy to to sort of stop that automatic thinking and and let those wonderful seeds of creativity arise yeah so before we end i want to ask you one final question but i i first want to hear a little bit about what's going on with your book i want you to tell people a little bit about it and what you're working on right now well, actually, um, it's very interesting. In the last few weeks, um, I've gone back into the Spinal Ward where my journey started, and I've decided to actually go and volunteer in the Spinal Ward um, and, and do some counselling for people that are having accidents. So I'm wow. really, really excited about that. Um, I'm also writing a program for hospitals. A um, Really, a, it's a program that I would call a resilience program because I find that resilience is probably the most important skill that we need in life. So uh, a, an empowerment resilience program that I plan to take um, through the hospital system in Australia and, and hopefully overseas um, in a similar way to John Kabat-Zinn took his mindfulness-based stress reduction. I'm hoping that this will become a program that will be able to be taught in hospitals. So I've got that and, of course... Um, my book's coming to America and speaking to America. It's time to spread my wings and, and come over there, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to do that. My my TED Talk's um, been going really well, and um, I'm just, I feel it um, just a great blessing that I'm able to share my story and, and also, you know, be blessed to hear other people's stories because I feel that that, um, that is how we connect and heal through our stories. And Janine, for everyone who doesn't know, could you tell people your website and the title of the book? Um, my first book is Never Tell Me Never, so we're mm-hmm. just, we're just, uh, it's not available. Well, they could probably find it, but um, that will hopefully be updated and published in America very soon. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are other books after that, but um, they'll be able to get my newest little book, The Gift of Acceptance, um, sometime later this year at Hallmark Shops anyway for this for a start and and that little book is actually a very powerful little book to give to someone if you know someone that's going through a hard time Mm -hmm. that's finding something difficult to accept in their life right now it's the perfect little book to give them yeah and then what's your website just so people can check you out also yeah Um, my website is www.janineshepherd.com got it and my final question janine is you're an inspiration to so many people and who's your inspiration? I get asked that question a lot. And, you know, there isn't one particular person. I am inspired by everybody, really. Anyone that keeps it real and honest and lives from their heart inspires me. I, you know, I, I am so privileged to be invited into other people's lives as they share their journey with me. And I have heard so many inspiring stories. Every day I'm touched by someone's story that really is doing it tough, is living with courage and living with their heart. So ordinary people doing extraordinary things in my eyes. I mean, when you were going through those challenges, was there anyone who sticks out to you that was inspiring you during those times? The people that inspired me during that time were the people that cared for me, the nursing staff. I had some amazing staff, and Mm -hmm. if it wasn't for them, sometimes I wonder you know, how I would have got through those incredibly difficult nights. So, again, it's the people that, you know, the people that we don't know. We might not necessarily know their names, but there are heroes everywhere. Yeah, I like the story you told about 
when you were in that room and you got to know everyone but you couldn't see them? Could you tell people a little bit about that? Well, lying in a spinal ward, of course, you're lying flat on your back. And, yeah. you, you know, a lot of people have got, you know, their heads uh, held tight in um, halo thoracic um, metal, uh, big metal contraptions to keep their heads still. So you can't move. You're just looking up at the roof. So yeah. we form these incredible relationships with each other. And that was very profound. And, you know, of course, there was the moment of the straws, which I don't want to give that away. I think they should watch my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> But, of course, you know, each of those people that were in that ward inspired me, particularly Maria, who I spoke about, who, you know, is a full quadriplegic. And, you know, we still keep in contact. And she's a beautiful girl. And during that whole time, and this is a girl that had this accident when she was 16, and she can only move her head. And she has never, ever complained to me. Whenever I speak to her, whenever I, you know, I was in the bed next to her, she was always smiling. And, and that was, you know, very important. I mean, that was, that was a blessing and a gift for me because I looked at her and thought, you know, she, she's so much worse off physically than I am, right. you know, yet she's always smiling. You know, where, where does she get that from? Where did she find that level of acceptance? And I don't think it was a coincidence that, you know, that I was in the bed next to her because that, that was an incredible gift for me, and she's a beautiful, beautiful girl. Yeah, and people will get that from you, Janine. So I really appreciate you taking the time uh, with us, and um, you know, good luck on your tour, and uh, we look forward to following that. Oh, look, I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm excited to come to America. I love America, and um, maybe one day I'll come to Chicago, Jeremy. <laughs> awesome. Thank yeah. you so much, Janine. It's been so great talking to you. You too. Thank you.